Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's event on uh, Oltre i Bordi, Beyond the Frame, and the discussion tonight with Simone Brioni, Uba Cristina Lifara, and Hope Campbell Gustafsson. I'm Elena Bellina, visiting assistant clinical professor here at NYU, and with my colleague Isabella Livorni, we'll be um, uh, organizing, we are organizing this event, and uh, we'll run the discussion at the end of the screening. So I'll pass the mic to... Yes, so I'm just going to read uh, the blurb of this event series. Um, this is part of a larger series. We've already had a number of events, um, but it's a series called Black, Black Italia, and it's a series of events of book discussions, theatrical performances, film screenings, and lectures that is sponsored by the Casa Italiana in collaboration with the Department of Italian Studies. It aims to promote conversations on the intersections of race, identity, and migration in Italy. Conceived in connection with courses taught in the Department of Italian Studies, Black Italia revisits the format launched by Casa Italiana's virtual salons, Discourses on Black Italia, held virtually during the pandemic, by bringing together artists and scholars in order to address questions about race and racialization across Italian history and its multifaceted diasporic geography. Oh, and there comes the director of Casa Italiana, Zerili Marimo, Stefano Albertini. Okay, okay, th thank you, Stefano. And tonight we have a rich and stimulating evening ahead of us, and we're very pleased to uh, have um, Simone, Uba Cristina, and Hope all back on this stage. They've all presented in the past at different events. And um, tonight we'll have, we'll start the evening with a discussion uh, with Uba Cristina Lifara and uh, Hope Gustav, um, Campbell Gustafsson. Then we'll screen the movie Oltre i Bordi, Beyond the Frame, and then there will be to follow a panel discussion with uh, the writer and director of the movie, Simone Brioni, and Uba Cristina Alifara. So we have three events. Uh, the first part will be half an hour. The film is 41 minutes, so if everything goes according to the plan, by uh, 7, 10, 7, 15, we should, no, 7, 30, 7, 40, we should be good to go. And then there will be a panel discussion. And uh, Stefano, do you want to welcome everybody? Or? I couldn't find the talk with the city light. So it's <laughs> outside in a little garden and the time is going up. So I'm going <laughs> to say good evening, run to put it there, and come back. Thank you for being here tonight. It's Good Friday. There are many things going on, so we appreciate your presence. Uh, this series is particularly dear to us because it, it exemplifies the way in which we work as CASA and department. And I always say that the department, that is the academic presence inside the building, is actually the soul and the heart of the CASA. Uh, the events that happen here rarely come from my mind alone. They come from a discourse, from a community of scholars, of teachers that share common interests, like the two colleagues that you just heard, and that want also to open up the doors of academia to the rest of the world. As you know, the ivory tower and all the things that we hear, well, sometimes they are true. And I think one of the great purposes of the CASA was to open up the windows and the doors and to let the community interact with the academic uh, community that is present here. And one more thing, specifically to the topic. Um, Italy is very behind on many things when it comes to um, civil rights, equal rights, uh, rights of immigrants, rights of different people of any kind. But in the past few years, we are very behind. Again, especially questions of citizenship, for example. You know, there is a long debate regarding who is an Italian, right? There are people who are born in Italy, lived there all their life, have not known any other country, and yet they cannot claim citizenship until they are 18, and it's not automatic at all. So there are big issues on the political and the juridical front. One aspect in which I think Italy seems to be a bit ahead is culture and the arts when it comes to dialogue, understanding um, of different uh, minorities, of different communities living together. Two examples. How many of you have seen Io Capitano? Very good. Too, too few. Go. Go see it. Io Capitano was the Italian film candidate to the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. I can say that it is an African film. The cast was completely uh, from Africa. The film was entirely shot in Africa. It's a story. It's a beautiful film, first of all. 
It's not a documentary. It's a feature. It's a story. And through the story of these two young men, two cousins, you see what happens before they arrive to the shores of Italy. And a few years ago, Fuoco Mare by Rosi was the first documentary film ever to win the Berlin Film Festival. So the country, when it comes to politics, is slow and very resistant to change uh, some uh, fundamental points that need to be changed because society changed. But I think there are signs of hope coming from the arts. And I think arts are there to educate and ultimately to create another mentality. And that's what my colleagues also do in their classes. They talk about the different kind of artistic and cultural expressions. And hopefully, it's going to be from there that change comes. Thank you very much to both of you, to our guests, and to all of you for being here tonight. Enjoy. Thank you, Stefano. And now we'll welcome on the stage Uba Cristina Alifara, who's a Somali-Italian poet, novelist, playwright, and librettist. She holds a PhD from the University of Naples, and she's the author of three novels, Madre Piccola, Il, Ca Il Comandante del Fiume, e, um, and Le Stazioni della Luna. Uh, that have, uh, especially Il Comandante del Fiume, the commander of the river, just came out with a translation by Hope Campbell Gustafson. That, that's why they're here tonight. And um, they'll talk more on the stage tonight about how they work in terms of translating cultures, translating languages, because as you'll hear, most of Uba's books are about this mixing Somali and Italian culture. As you'll hear, Uba was born in Italy uh, and then grew up in uh, Mogadishu, but we'll hear more from the two of them. So please welcome them to the stage, and later on we'll welcome also Simone. Thank you. Hello, buonasera. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, it's a, a great honor to be here. Um, I'm, I translate Uba's work into English. We've been collaborating for the past seven plus years, um, so a long relationship. And a year ago about um, this novel, um, Commander of the River, um, came out in English um, from Indiana University Press. They have a great um, Global African Voices series um, that they publish. And um, Uba, would you like to talk about the book and introduce it a little bit? Yeah, thank you so much, Hope. I'm, I'm very happy to be here after a year. I was here in this, I mean, on this stage for Multipli Forti last year. And um, so coming back is is so beautiful and um, so I'm very happy that because you were talking about citizenship and um, Commander of the River in fact is um, is a novel about uh, a Somali born um, a, a young a young boy who was born in Mordishu and um, when he's telling the story it's um, uh, he's 18 years old and he grew up in Rome and basically he has to navigate the city and find his own identity and um, and for me it was really I was asking myself really about trauma because uh, what about the second generation of kids that grew up in Italy even though they don't have a memory of what happened before uh, what um, remains in their in, in their memory um, in their post memory in a way so it is it is about it it is a young boy uh, born, uh, raised in Italy, but uh, with other, uh, with a Somali descent. Um, our plan in this short period of time is to read a couple excerpts, um, mainly in English, but also a little bit in Italian, um, and excerpts that we chose that um, will then sort of lead us towards the film that you'll be watching tonight. Um, dealing with memory, with images, um, family photos, with language. Um, yes, okay. This first short excerpt um, is a memory um, that Yabar, the main character, has um, about 
getting to know him and his mother, getting to know someone he calls Zia Rosa, um, and Sisi, her daughter in Rome. Um, they've just recently met, but they become like family. Um, let me open the book. We were in the living room of her house, she in the armchair framed by two elephant tusks. My father was a fascist, she said, as if to justify them. In those days, Italians enjoyed going hunting. We all have our secrets, replied my mom, laughing. The sins of men don't concern us. Then Zia Rosa pulled an old photo album off her bookshelf. Look, these were taken in Mogadishu after independence. There are some photos from the 80s, too. In our house, my mom and I didn't keep, have any keepsakes. No objects, images, newspapers, not a thing. Mama always says that memory is a burden and we Somalis carry it all inside. She doesn't want to have reminders in front of her every day. That's why our house is so bare. Mama doesn't keep anything. If something isn't used for over two months, she says she needs to tidy up and gets rid of it. The same treatment is reserved even for books. That's why there are libraries, she asserts. And after reading them, she donates them to the bookstalls. But that day, confronted with the images of her hometown, she was like a child again. Come look, Yabar, she shouted, clapping her hands with enthusiasm. While flipping through the photos, she showed me the Azan Bakery, where they sent her to buy bread when she was little the Croce del Sud restaurant, famous for its cream beignets, the Missione movie theater, which showed spaghetti westerns. Oh, Hotel Gouled, do you remember how, when you were a little boy, we'd go there on Fridays? We'd swim and then eat lunch by the pool? I always ordered the Ville Scalopina with lemon. You liked it a lot, too. I'd cut it up into teeny tiny pieces. I racked my brain, but it didn't do any good. Then, suddenly, a memory surfaced. It's my father. He's swimming freestyle in the pool without stopping. I see him from behind, his hands cleaving the water without making a sound, a fast and foamless wake. Only an instant, then the image vanishes. And now, Aunt Zara, Sisi asked her, now what's it like? Now Mogadishu is all destroyed, honey, Mama replied with a hint of sadness in her voice. But grandma's grave is there, so that means we'll never be able to go visit her, my little sister exclaimed. Zia Rosa told us about how every so often they would put flowers on her grandpa's gravestone and that she'd had to explain to Cece why her grandma wasn't there too. I'll teach you the words to say, mama then promised, so that when she appears in your dreams, you can have a nice conversation. Do you know what they say in Somalia? that when a person sleeps, their soul goes to a timeless place where it meets the people who are no longer around and those who are yet to be born. That's why it's important to wake a sleeping person gently, because their soul might need more time to return. And so from that day forward, she began speaking not only to me, but also to Sisi almost exclusively in Somali, and in such a natural way that we didn't even realize it. Zia Rosa was so happy about it that she finally found the courage to speak in her mother tongue. Contrary to her fears, as a matter of fact, she hadn't completely forgotten it. Who knows if memories have a language? Maybe languages are simply colors that mark off different areas of memory. Thank you. So um, we wanted to start with this uh, excerpt and uh, talk about the Comandante because even though apparently it doesn't have any kind of relationship with the film, I think that there is a strong relationship. And uh, we were talking with uh, Simone because basically uh, the, pr the present is very connected with the past and uh, memory is important to understand also what is happening now in Italy. Um, so that, um, I mean, uh, Jabber is able to understand his story and to go back to the past because he's able to see these pictures and. Uh, and to reconnect with this story that connects Italy with Somalia. And unfortunately, we don't speak, talk a lot about this, but um, um, yeah, so I think that the two things apparently doesn't have to do, but is imp very important to um, 
be, I mean, aware of this burden of the memory to to be able to interpret the pr the present as well. Yeah. Thanks, Supa. Um, and then one more excerpt, just a few pages later in the same chapter. Um, this is from a powerful scene in which Yabar is asked to act as an interpreter um, for a new friend um, who no longer speaks Somali. And his mother, who this person has, hasn't seen in over 20 years, I think, is that right? Um, spoken to for years, who does not speak Italian. Um, they've just walked into a call center in Rome together. And Uma and I will be reading together, in a way. It was almost midnight when I went with Liban to call, and even though it was far from hot out, we were both sweating heavily. I was sweating because I felt like I no longer remembered a word of Somali, he because he'd be speaking to his mother for the first time in 20 years. The call center was a cramped little store with many glass booths inside. There were signs in various languages, and through the transparent walls you could see people talking. Each of them moved their mouths in a different way, but you couldn't hear their voices. They were like fish packed inside an aquarium. As soon as we walked in, the manager, a man with a white beard, asked us, where do you want to call? And we explained the situation to him so that he'd give us a phone with two receivers, since Liban and I needed to both talk and listen. Dopo qualche minuto ci fa entrare in una cabina con due cornette. Lo spazio è risicato e fa un caldo infernale. Siamo sudati, l'aria è bollente, il numero telefonico è infinito, il prefisso è infinito e il tempo che ci mettono a rispondere è infinito. Mi sembra di stare in una grotta umida e penso che anche in telefono dall'altra parte sia un posto del genere, una caverna bollente come la nostra, con dentro la madre di Liben che aspetta da vent'anni. Il telefono squilla, attendo la voce e Liban mi fissa perché ha paura del mio silenzio. Mi dice, coraggio, e dall'altra parte sento, hello, yawai, pronto, chi è? Parlano in somalo e capisco tutto, ma finora ho solo trasformato il somalo in italiano. Non so trasformare l'italiano in somalo io. After a few minutes, he lets us into a booth with two handsets. The space is very narrow and it's hot as hell. We're sweaty, the air is boiling, the phone number endless, the calling code endless, and the time it takes them to pick up endless. I feel like I'm in a damp cave, and I picture the telephone at the other end, also in a place like this. A boiling hot cavern like ours with Liban's mother who's been waiting, inside waiting for 20 years. The phone rings, I wait for a voice, and Liban stares at me because he's afraid of my silence. He tells me, you got this. And from the other end, I hear, hello, Yahweh, hello, who is it? They're speaking in Somali, and I understand everything. But until now, I've only ever transformed Somali into Italian. I don't know how to transform Italian into Somali. Dell'altro capo del telefono dicono, hello, e Liben mi ripete, coraggio, e io vedo le parole in fila dentro la testa, le sento e le vedo tutte. Scalciano e prendono forma come noci e io spingo con la fronte e con gli occhi per farle passare. Le parole sono dure, mi tagliano la testa come quando fa caldo e bevi qualcosa di gelido. Sento una fitta tra gli occhi e riprendo fiato. Ma anche così il dolore non smette. Allora ricomincio a spingere con forza ed ecco che sento le parole venirmi alla gola e tocco la loro forma con la lingua. Spingo l'aria fuori e le parole fuoriescono intere dalla mia bocca. From the other end of the line, they repeat, hello, and Liban says, you got this, again, and I see the words line up in my head. I feel and see all of them. They kick and take shape like whole walnuts, and I push with my forehead and my eyes to get them out. The words are hard. They cut through my head like when it's hot out and you drink something icy cold. I feel a stabbing pain between my eyes and catch my breath. But the pain still doesn't stop, so I start pushing again, pushing hard, and now I feel the words come to my throat, and I touch their shape with my tongue. I push air out, and the words spill out whole from my mouth. 
Vedo lì Ben sorridermi e dire «Mamma, sono io!» Lo dice balbettando e io ripeto balbettando le sue stesse parole «Hoyo wa nega» e le parole «Mamma, sono e io» suonano uguali nella nuova lingua, forse solo un po' più secche. Lì Ben è frenetico e vuole parlare di troppe cose, di quanto l'ha cercata, di quanto gli è mancata, di quanto l'ha pensata, ma riesce a dire solo parole semplici e la madre ripete le stesse cose e io sono la madre e il figlio allo stesso tempo. I see Li Ben smiling at me and saying, Mamma, it's me, his voice cracking, and I repeat, voice cracking, the same words, Hoyo, wa aniga, and the words, Mamma, it's, and me, sound the same in the new language, maybe just a bit drier. Li Ben is frantic. He wants to talk about too many things at once, about how much he searched for her, how much he's missed her, how much he's thought of her, but he's only able to say simple words, and his mother says the same things, and I'm the mother and the son at the same time. Siamo nella grotta e l'aria è bollente. Io e Liven siamo tutti sudati e teniamo ciascuno una cornetta legata a un filo. La voce della madre arriva tutte e due e le nostre voci le arrivano insieme. Sento le parole tutte intere nella bocca. Era tanto tempo che non le sentivo e quelle parole sono le parole del figlio e sono anche le mie. Liven, io e Liven diciamo insieme hoio, mamma e wa aniga sono io. We're in the cave and the air is boiling. Liban and I are both all sweaty and we're each holding a handset attached to one cord. The voice of his mother reaches both of us and our voices reach her together. I feel the words whole in my mouth. It had been a long time since I'd felt them. And these words are the words of the son and they're also mine. Liban and I together say, Hoyo, mamma, and wa aniga, it's me. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that um, it, for me was maybe um, it's really a piece about translation, about giving birth to language and uh, not re remember, thinking of, of not remembering the language and uh, but being able to talk again in a way. So I would love to, uh, to ask Hope to say something about what it meant for her to translate in this book. I mean, the, the most difficult passages, the thing, because there, is, there are often also Somali words and uh, Somali English and um, languages are often mixed in, in the book. So how was for you um, this Thank experience? You. Thank well, you. Um, well, uh, there's, let's see. Um, it was a great honor to translate this book. Um, Uba's writing, as you heard, is often very visual, and um, it's also not chronolog chronological or linear throughout the book. Um, uh, the prose voice is embodied and very personal, um, and there's a d uh, you feel a deep sense of the Somali oral tradition in the book, um, both in the way it's constructed and in the ways that the, even sentences um, are sound. Um, uh, a lot of Uba plays a lot of attention to sound and something we did together. We really collaborated on this project together and um, we were at a writing residency together and um, we were able to uh, experiment by, I had a full draft of the book and Uba read out loud in Italian while I was correcting my English to get it closer to the sort of rhythms and sound of um, the Italian as, as best I could. Um, um, as she said, she, not in this section as much, but she weaves Somali words and phrases into the text, often without, um, there's no italics, and often without defining what th these words mean exactly, um, which can be alienating to a reader, um, so it's, you know, a, a form of linguistic resistance, I would say. Um, uh, this section is one of the more lyrical sections of the book. Um, as you could hear, it has momentum, this pacing um, is very important, and I stayed very close to the Italian in this, in this section. You, those of you who speak both languages probably heard um, the sentence lengths, the syntax, the repetition, um, the images. Um, I tried to even, I added some repetition to get more of that sense of Italian that has sounds that repeat over and over. Um, uh, 
there's a few things that I could point at in this section um, that could be debated also, you know, um, but translating you coraggio into you got this um, has sort of been a, a piece of contention, but I, um, I thought long and hard about that and, and chose you got this because it, it really ties it to this character of this 18-year-old boy and it's colloquial and it's, it's um, strong and very, um, I feel like, believable for the, the character. Um, and other pieces translating uh, caldo infernale is hot as hell. Again, that brings it to this colloquial, tying it to the character, 18-year-old 18, 18 boy, um, I thought. Um, uh, yeah, a whole walnut site said I translated instead of nochi, um, and whole comes out later, this whole um, pushing it out whole at the end is, um, you know, the idea of giving giving birth, and it sort of gives more form to the the nochi, and um, it repeats sort of a sound and um, and a word. Um, yeah, I don't know. There were other pieces that are hard to see when you don't see the text, um, and of course you can workshop a translation forever, um, and and maybe I would have changed things that I had um, written here, but. Um, yeah, I don't know, Uva, if there's anything else that... Do, do you want to connect it to the, to the film yeah, that's coming? Yeah, I think that because I was thinking about translation and translating memory through images and um, the movie, um, I, don't, I don't want to spoil the movie, so we can discuss about the movie later, but uh, it's all about um, translating um, a book and translating memory through images is... Uh, in a way, that there is a sort of uh, a connection. So I thought that it was important to to see how we do this through words, through translation, to translation into English, and uh, how we can do it uh, through images as well. So um, yeah, so I, I thought that it would be nice, the past and the present, and um, yeah, um, this is my my idea. Thank you so much, Hope. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for staying. Now we can open the floor to questions to them. As you see, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, if there isn't any opening question, I have something to ask you right away. You work so much on photography, memory, and language. One of the things you don't mention too often in the movies is that Brescia, the city of Brescia, is the lioness of Italy. It brings these nicknames, so all these references to the lion of Juba, all the images of the lion on the hills overlooking Brescia. And so this, this very tight connection with the African landscape in your personal life, in the history of the city of Brescia with the Quartiere Via dei Libici, or even with uh, if, uh, last month, in February, we had uh, another person featured in this movie, uh, the Moroccan Bresciano uh, director, uh, Elia Mutamid, who, of all things, recites a poem in Bresciano dialect, not in Italian, not in Moroccan language, not in Arabic, but in the dialect of the city of Brescia. So all these layers, how did you order them, or how do you, did you uh, combine them in your writing the movie, preparing the movie, with all this rich material, visual material, linguistic material, history, layers of history, and people, real people? Um, no, well, I think uh, one important... Um, so the, the film is really about making a film to some extent. Uh, it's not... Uh, uh, so it really shows the process uh, in, uh, uh, in the making. Uh, you know, we kind of begin, began, you know, with this surprise and curiosity, you know, of finding this, uh, um, you know, um, box of photographs. And then we built up uh, a story which, uh, you know, uh, constantly developed. And, uh, uh, you know, Uba, uh, comes uh, well at the beginning and at the end because uh, you know it is uh, uh, thanks uh, to her uh, you know work that I have uh, been able to look at Italian colonialism from a different perspective uh, but 
you know, we were able to intercept her, uh, you know, at the end of the film, and thanks uh, to, uh, you know, our collaboration, then I was able to go back to the, uh, you know, beginning of the film, re-narrate or rewrite certain parts, etc. It's a very artisanal, independent way of uh, writing a film, definitely, um, you know, but, but it was uh, necessary for us to kind of, uh, you know, rewrite, uh, re, uh, you know, watch these photographs also because they were very little uh, and uh, sometimes they were small, no, in size. And so, I, I'm, you know, looking uh, at them, you know, uh, in a big screen was a way for us also to rethink about them. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, uh, translating uh, uh, the documentary, which was part of a, a process with the students. Actually, you can see there are actually more translators uh, than people who made the film, uh, almost 70 translators, uh, was also a way to rethink about uh, the film itself. I see. I have another question. I have a question. Unless the if the audience wants to jump in, that's some, that's some Gregorian chant. But if the audience wants to um, jump in at any point, please do. I have I have a question that I'll that I'll ask. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the idea also uh, related to. Um, the conversation that you and Hope had at the beginning and the excerpts that you read of the idea of memory and the body. And you know, they, they, the, we conclude on your beautiful poem, which I'm, I really love, of, and, and your comment on the kind of the question of the monument and the body as monument and the monument as body. Um, but also in one of the excerpts, the idea of not keeping the mother saying, we don't need to keep keepsakes because we bear the memory, we bear it. Um, and so I'm wondering, kind of thinking of through the lens of the documentary, what is the relationship between memory and the body um, on, on, on potentially both, both sides, on the sides of the colonized and of the colonizer? What, what's happening there is kind of my broad question for you. Uh, no, definitely, you know, the bodies are, uh, you know, are central in the film, in these photographs, but also in my own personal uh, uh, positioning. Uh, I mean, definitely the images want us to see reality through a certain, you know, they want to frame reality in a certain way. And so for me, it was uh, really important to, you know, to look at these uh, images. Uh, uh, so they kind of wanted force forced me to see Africa through a certain perspective, which was uh, the perspective of the colonized, uh, and to some extent, uh, you know, uh, I also, you know, as as I said, now my privilege is uh, a limitation in a sense. Of course, uh, you know, I benefit from it, but it's also uh, a limitation. I remember once. Uh, I was uh, at the University of Warwick and I invited uh, um, uh, Ribka Sibatu to come on campus and I wanted to show her uh, the campus uh, and what she saw in our walk together was that there were no, you know, black people around. There were only uh, white students, you know, and uh, of course, uh, I mean, I, I was aware of that, but I never actually saw it through her perspective. This is precisely what, uh, um, you know, how... I introduce uh, uh, Uba's, Uba Christina's uh, coming into uh, the scene. No? It's definitely, you know, her perspective, the dialogue we had uh, at the end of the film brings in another perspective on these, uh, on these photographs, uh, which are provide mostly a male uh, perspective, the perspective of the colonizers. Thank you so much for this question. I think uh, the body yeah, it's so important, it's so involved in the, all this history. And um, I think that for me, as I was saying during also the movie, um, being in a way the daughter of this, that the, is uh, the consequence of this history. I mean, in a way, because my father went to Italy uh, as a student with a scholarship. And uh, so basically it is also because of this history that I exist. Otherwise I wouldn't exist in a way. So um, when, it, when I talk about uh, the woman perspective and the position, I mean, um, when, when we had this uh, uh, recording of the scene, um, Simone 
kind had in kindly invited me to present my, my last novel that is in fact about uh, about uh, the 50s in Somalia when the Italians went went back to to Somalia for the Italian trusteeship and uh, and I was working I, and I worked with archives for some years to to be able to write that book and um, so I was really connected to, to that idea of uh, Reading through the lenses, also beyond the boards of this, uh, the frame of this, I mean, uh, these pictures, and uh, reading through the, the the gaze. And there is something important that I would I would like to say about uh, about uh, the, the the idea of the body. In in this in this movie, you don't see images of uh, naked women, but it was very, uh, I mean. Um, there were a lot of pictures about to I mean to uh, invite some especially male young male to go to Eastern Africa and to colonize um, postcards with TP uh, Donna no somehow uh, often naked and um, there was a um, a director, a film director that had, had done a beautiful documentary, and uh, during an, an interview, she's, she's a woman, and she said, um, "I decided only to keep the the gaze, so the gaze of the woman. They they were all postcards, but uh, I decided instead um, to to keep the, the the face of this woman, but not to show the the." That it, that were naked, so uh, the gaze is is very important in a way because they were in a, anyway they were proud and um, even though they were forced to show their their body. Yeah. If there, if there is any question from the audience. Great. To speak. Okay. First of all, I like as a Stony Brook graduate. I was wondering how Stony Brook helped with the film, um, and also as a human rights attorney, I represented someone. I guess the saddest case they've ever done: someone that escaped from Eritrea and came to the U.S. and we lost because it happened right after 9/11, and there was this whole resentment, and he had to go back to to a certain death that that was there, and I was just wondering. In some ways, if there's a next film or something else that's coming up, but you know, would you see the lands happening now that it's that Italy is is away, but there's still turmoil going on in Somalia and Eritrea and and, and the others. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, uh, so. Um, actually, this film comes after uh, two other movies, uh, one about Eritrea and one about Somalia, uh, which were made uh, uh, respectively with uh, Kaha Mohamed Aden, La Quarta Via, and uh, Rib Kassibatu, Aulo. Um, well, I'm not uh, um, you know, a um, political scientist, uh, so I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in question of uh, memory and, uh, and, and um, the legacy of colonialism. But I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, it is, uh, you know, the, the situation, I mean, Italy is definitely giving a lot of money to the uh, dictatorship in Eritrea to keep migrants, to prevent them to come uh, into, uh, into the country. Uh, and we know that, you know, is one of the most, um, um, you know, uh, cruel um, re regimes in, in Africa, uh, the, the, the regime in Eritrea. But I think something that we wanted to say in this uh, film is precisely that, uh, uh, you know, we cannot uh, um, uh, somehow divorce uh, um, colonial history from what is happening today in, uh, uh, you know, with migrations, no? We cannot somehow disjoin these, uh, these two, uh, you know, uh, stories uh, which are closely uh, connected. Uh, and, uh, mm, you know, definitely, uh, you know, discourses about migration are still uh, informed by a certain gaze, certain narratives which were created precisely during the colonial period. Grazie. Prego. But Uba, if I may interject, Uba may have something to say because Uba received a grant from the United Nations to work through storytelling uh, with the children of the last civil war in Somalia, right, Uba? 
Can you talk, us, yeah, yeah. talk a little bit about uh, that experience? Yeah, I worked for a couple of years uh, with. Uh, um, it's mainly it's uh, it it's apparently not connected with, um, but it is because uh, somehow it it it, it was uh, oral history for peace building. We 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 had a civil war in 1991 in Somalia, and um, I mean it, it's still persisting. I mean, I went back. I was able to go back to Somalia after 30 years. Um, not long ago, and um, basically the idea was really to, um, because this kind of uh, clan, um, this divider of the clan in, in, in the Somali society was especially introduced by Italian colonialism. I mean, they, they have always been clans in Somalia, but uh, uh, with this kind of, um, uh, uh, this idea of dividing and uh, giving something to some clown and uh, punishing and uh, using this kind of techniques that were, I mean, it's always powers does this kind of things. Um, I mean, then is exacerbated during the, the, the period of Siad Baris um, rule in Somalia. And then, um, and then I think, so we don't, talk about it in Somalia, I mean, especially in, do, in, in those years. And it was very important also to interview and uh, asking people of different also positions to talk about their history, young people. And uh, we still have this, I mean, and uh, it is a legacy of what happened before. Yeah. And I just want to add, I think it's a very timely, especially now with Gaza, mm -hmm. right? I think it's clear. And also I, in Haiti, we were planning an invasion in the US Canada and France to go in, and the people in Haiti are saying, no, we don't want former colonizers to come back in. So I think this film is very, very timely. Yes, so. yes, I mean, I'm thinking also, I mean, in, as part of The Commander of the River, there is, a, there is a scene in which these young descendants of formerly colonized subjects who have come to Italy are explicitly critiquing um, the lack of responsibility that um, Italy has hi historically taken in, in terms of colonials. Uh, this is what you were saying, um, Simone, of this kind of question of migration being linked to colonial pasts and Italy's refusal to accept any kind of responsibility, um, especially for also deaths of of immigrants from formerly colonized countries attempting to do, had have the crossing to Italy. And I know you also critique this in, in Madre Piccola and Little Mother comes up quite a bit. The question of Italy's abdicated responsibility in its colonial forgetting, um, which just to, just to kind of reinforce Guzate, what, what Simone and Uba have already been saying. Hi, my name is Carmen. Uh, thank you for this evening's performance. And it was a performance indeed. Uh, it, it I have a memory. I used to live in Italy and I lived in Rome. And I'm wondering, is this history taught in university or in schools? Do Italians know the colonial past? No. Unfortunately, yeah, there is not okay. much um, debate. I think things have changed yeah. now. There are there is a, you know there are a lot more uh, novels, <laughs> uh, you know history books uh, and sure. grassroots movements. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the m reasons to make this film was also and uh, make it available online uh, mm -hmm. is precisely to have these stories mm -hmm. more uh, you know known. Uh, sure. And uh, you okay. know. the reason why I ask is when uh, I lived there in the seventies. And um, I had a friend, I had a colleague. I wrote, I, I worked for a, a daily rag called the Rome Daily American, which was a composite of asso associate press releases and stories. And I was with an African-American friend and we both worked there. And we were walking down the street and two men came behind us and she got very scared and she said, run, and they ran, out, ran after us because they wanted to touch her. A lot of people in Rome wanted to touch her, because she was, she was dark, as am I, uh, but I, I look more Italian than she does, 
And she was really very, very scared. And I finally asked her, why did you run? Why didn't you turn around and say something? She said, it made me very afraid. It reminded me of the South. You know, and when I saw these white men coming towards us and trying to touch me, that, w that was my memory. So I was just wondering if this was taught, is there uh, some kind of race relations program that NYU and, no? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. I would also, oh, sorry. I would also thank you for this presentation. It was um, quite a remarkable film and, and reading as well. So grazie mille. Um, I preface my question by saying we were here the other night and had a presentation about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire Factory in which we discussed the idea that history must be made individual. That, yes, 146 people died, but each of them had a name. And so your film does that as well, I, I think. A, a few years ago, we were here for another film presentation, a young documentarian who discovered his family had fascists and anti-fascists uh, in the background. So this personalization of history is so important to our understanding of history. But I think my real question follows on um, the previous question, um, she, she asked about teaching it in Italian schools. I'd have to say Americans are completely ignorant of this entire chapter in history. I mean, we're, we, we're not very good at history in the first place. So I, I suppose the question is, how do we deal with... Uh, memory is one thing, but if you have the ignorance of history, that's a very, very different, different and difficult problem. Um, how, how do you think we should approach that? Can I, can I answer a little bit about some of what we're doing here at, at NYU? I will say I've seen, I've seen a shift over the past eight years uh, from when I first started teaching about Italian colonialism and my students were like, what, we never heard of this, that's, that's wild. And I will say over the, over the past eight years, there's more of a sense when I say, did you all know that Italy was a colonial power? They're like, oh yeah, yeah. Like They don't know details always, but they're aware of that. So I, I think that's already, just in the past eight years, for me has been kind of amazing to see. Um, and I, but I do, say, I do think that you know, generally the courses I teach are geared toward non-specialists. I have a couple of my students in the audience <clears throat> and uh, who are not necessarily super linked to Italy, but are, are curious to know about histories of Italian colonialism and also histories of migrations to and from Italy. Um, and they're, they, they're quick learners, they're, they're fast studies. Um, you, give, you give context, I think it's very useful to have things like what uh, Simone and Uba create, um, both academically and, and creatively to be able to um, give to students, to have this kind of concrete um, artistic production to be able to, grap uh, to grapple with, I think has been meaningful to me. But I don't know, Simone and Uba and Elena as instructors, um, when you are kind of pedagogues in these, this material, what, what challenges do you face? So, no, I think uh, uh, an important point about this film that, that we didn't want to make a history movie because I'm not a historian. You see the poster. The poster is, uh, you know, bright uh, green and bright uh, pink. We wanted to dehistoricize this narrative and talk about, uh, uh, you know, the story, you know, through a very mm, personal lens. Um, and so this is what, you know, my personal approach uh, uh, to that history. Uh, but I think the most important uh, perhaps thing that we wanted to say about the, um, you know, by making this film is, uh, you know, history is not uh, written. 
we constantly rewrite it. Uh, we have to make alive these uh, traces of history, uh, you know, the photographs uh, of our family, uh, you know, where we come from, uh, you know, the, the street signs that we find in, uh, you know, in, uh, in our streets, uh, the, uh, you know, the um, piazzas in Brescia, no? the signs of, uh, you know, the, the statue of this uh, virile white uh, uh, man were actually destroyed by, you know, the resistance, by uh, the uh, the Partisans, no, after World War II. So history is never stable. It's something that is constantly mediated, renegotiated, etc. Documentaries are, you know, cheap to produce. I mean, um, uh, they can they can be a way to re-narrate, to renegotiate historical memory. You know? um, and of course, another way are novels. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, something. I for me, very important is that when you were talking about history as individual histories, I mean, it's, it's very important because uh, also in Italy there was all this campaign against migration and so on. But then I was, um, I don't live in Italy anymore, unfortunately, since, I mean, um, uh, 12 years. But at the same time, uh, when I was living there, I was working a lot as uh, a translator as a mediatore culturale, they say as a um, cultural mediator. And um, I thought that really if people, often people that arrive in Italy are people, very, very young people, and, uh, and they have this kind of uh, energy and power and uh, they so much believe in life, in, uh, in, in the future, that um, if we stop just talking about numbers of people arriving, would be better. And the other thing about uh, individual history is uh, also that in uh, when when I arrived in in Italy in the early 90s, there were many Somalis because it was the first place where they would go after the civil war. And then uh, Italy completely ignored them. They didn't have any possibility to stay in the country, and they left. And um, this is also something. Uh, I mean, responsibility of history and uh, what was about the past and, yeah, so this thing. And if I may uh, add to this, I mean, we need great novels, great writers who are first and second generation, uh, Somali, Italian, or any possible new generations in Italy that write and that, that are translated in English. Uh, thank you for, to people like um, uh, Hope and two grants, like the Pen Award grant for the translation that um, um, Hope did for um, the, the, the Commander of the River. And that's the way we here in the US can talk about this past colonial Italian history through novels, through poems that are translated in English. In this country, very few people can read Italian, can read these novels in Italy. So if these novels come out in Italian in Italy, they, of course they speak to a certain uh, generation in Italy, the new generations that Uba and the previous speakers on this stage from the same series mentioned, people uh, under 50 in Italy are no longer a problem. That's what <laughs> Ilya, Ilya said. Uh, people yeah, older than 50 are still a problem, that's what he said, and I'm quoting Elia <laughs> Mutamid if he's following. He was, very, he, he was talking to my students and he said, well, you know, we talk about all this racism, which is true, uh, um, but at the same time, there are new generations open, open to new, new discourses, to new books, to new writers, to new intellectuals, public intellectuals, who speak to them. And, of course, they know about this past and they're very interested in it because they're exposed to it in a very uh, open way. So they can know it, express their opinions, and learn more. And we can do that here in the U.S. if there aren't good translations, like Hope's translations, and many more to come, hopefully. Stefano has a question. very structured, that was the version of history that fascism created to justify all the things that we said today. The myth of a great Italy, no longer the Italietta, the cute little Italy, but great power. That 
uh, kind of representation of history, that historiography, lasted way after the fall of fascism. And then there was the other Italian tendency, that is, i panni sporchi si lavano in casa. So the embarrassing parts of our history are never explored. And the two things that you mentioned are very related. One is the history of Italians as immigrants, and it's the history of poverty, of people being forced to leave because they couldn't find a way to survive in Italy. And then there is the history of colonialism. Uh, when I went to high school, I remember there was a total maybe of half a page regarding the phenomenon of mass migration from Italy to the New World, and especially the US, that between 1880 and 1920 saw four million people just coming to the US. F five lines, a paragraph, nothing else. Even if you consider it from the point of view, the mere point of view of numbers, it doesn't make any sense that there is nothing said about this chunk of Italians that moved in mass here why they came, what was their life here, what kind of attitude did the Italian government have towards them? Zero, nothing. Um, so there is the, these histories that are sort of denied, forgotten, censored, and it is a, a fact that many of the most important innovative studies regarding both the history of migration, Italian migration to the New World and of Italian colonialism were originated in this country, not in Italy. Uh, you might remember the great uh, historian Del Bocca that was the first one to really uh, break the myth of Italiani brava gente. As Italians had a very cute way of going to war because they never kill anybody, they don't rape anybody, they never set fire. No. And Del Bocca revealed uh, with very, very accurate uh, investigations that that was a myth and all the crimes committed by Italians. By the way, Del Bocca never got a job in an Italian university. He was a journalist. He conducted this incredible uh, historiographical research, basically by himself, and being isolated uh, from the academic community. So just providing some sort of, of, of context to uh, how important it is that in this country, this uh, um, phenomenon was analyzed, studied, without the constrictions that survived in Italy way after the fall of the fascist regime. And the, the work you're doing is extremely precious. Thank you. Is there another question? One final question. Yes. I was uh, shocked to see uh, early image in the film to the, uh, I'm not sure the exact name, the Italian Automobile Traveling Association or something, because the first time I saw the title of your movie, I was thinking of an old 1930s magazine from that exact association that was talking about the great new world to come when Italians would build big roads in their colonies and they'd all be driving around in those countries. And I wondered if you're family from then had that, you know, association with cars and that type of adventure, and maybe whether that was an appeal to colonialism. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about that side of the family, because I don't know enough, and also the people, they, are, they, they, they died or so, but definitely, the idea of uh, you know the um, you know motors uh, automobiles etc was uh, a general obsession in italy which still uh, kind of uh, i think the most notable uh, uh, remains of that uh, you know, the velocity uh, myth uh, imported by the Italians in Eritrea is, is actually cycling. Cycling in Eritrea is the most, uh, you know, famous uh, uh, sport, uh, is actually very popular still. Um, and I think, you know, uh, perhaps something that we try to think about in the film was uh, how using certain, you know, different technologies, uh, like using a car or using uh, a train, etc., cetera, um, somehow or, you know, and looking at the landscape uh, 
by using uh, certain means of transportation or by using a photograph, etc., cetera, um, somehow provides us with a different uh, view on the land. No, I think um, you know if you walk uh, through a territory or if we you know take a car, uh, we have a different perception of that uh, kind of 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 territory. And I think uh, really uh, this uh, um, this uh, uh, film it's also a film. It's it's a pandemic film. We shot it during uh, um, you know, and, and I was able to actually do research uh, on uh, uh, Borgo Satollo precisely because I was stuck there. I couldn't uh, go, you know, uh, I couldn't go anywhere else. I was, uh, you know, it was a red zone, and so you know, I interviewed people. Uh, I was able to, you know, walk, <laughs> you know, in the village uh, to kind of find these uh, traces, you know. And it's really, um, you know, even if I don't talk about, I mean, I mean. It's, it's a film in which I walk a lot, but it is really about walking, you know. Uh, I really went around walking. I, I actually walked through all the streets that carry these, uh, you know, colonial names. I wanted to see where they were. There were streets that actually, you know, I, I, I walked through uh, many times, you know, but I actually never actually noticed or just did some, you know, research about them. I discovered by making the film that there were, you know, these Libyans deported to Italy to Work. So immigration really started, uh, you know, if you wish, with a deportation of workers that actually needed to work uh, in Italian factories. Uh, um, so, yeah, and that's uh, what we try to do. Thank you for the beautiful film. Um, following um, you, you, your point, um, Uma, is um, for your family, your growing up, did your father, did you, your grandfather, did your people tell you about this, the Italian invasion? Was it spoken about? And the second part of that question is, what prompted the two of you to get together um, and to be interested in the subject matter and to work together? And my third question comment was, is like, you kept on talking about every Italian family has one of these boxes of photographs. You said that with such definiteness. Um, and do you really believe that? And is there something more you want to do about all those boxes that are out there? So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll start from uh, So, um, yes, I didn't know. My, n nobody in my family talked about this. Uh, this story it was kind of forgotten. Italians want to forget about, uh, to, uh, to forget colonialism because uh, it was so important to, uh, you know, it was such a foundational moment in constructing the uh, Italian national identity. It was such a foundational moment in whiten uh, Italians uh, uh, in a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mm, somehow, you know, it fun it really functions uh, in the uh, construction of national identity precisely as uh, immigration. No? It kind of uh, unifies, uh, homogenizes people who have uh, you know, very different histories, uh, very different uh, languages, uh, uh, etc. So it is very important. That's why people don't want to talk about it. Because once uh, you start talking about colonialism, well, it shows that this national unity and homogeneity, what we consider to be Italian, is actually a myth, a huge construction. No, uh, so it's um, no, it wasn't. You know, nobody in my family wanted to talk about it, um, and uh, and. Uh, um, um, what else? Uh, and then, uh, and then about uh, us. Um, so while I studied colonialism, I, I actually studied uh, American literature when I was a graduate student, uh, and I saw that there was still a lot to be done in Italy to, you know, in terms of, you know, with critical race theory, etc. And I started uh, reading the work uh, uh, by uh, immigrant uh, authors uh, in Italian and also by author by Italian authors uh, uh, who. Uh, 
grow up like, like Cuba, uh, who grew up in uh, Somalia, were born in Italy. Uh, and uh, it was so incredibly fascinating, really bringing a new perspective on the country. And uh, this is how I became interested in making the film. And, uh, you know, and I decided to collaborate with Cuba because uh, I've known her for a long time uh, by now. I, I really like uh, her work uh, and, uh, you know, to some extent is, uh, is an homage to her, uh, the, 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 the film, because, uh, you know, reading her work uh, was really eye-opening uh, to me. Um, and uh, somehow the film is uh, autobiographical and inspired precisely because it shows uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, um, um, this kind of uh, awareness uh, that was uh, acquired uh, uh, thanks uh, uh, to uh, uh, her work, but also the work uh, of uh, other writers with whom I have collaborated. Oh, by family. Okay, it's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember. I was, I was just trying to, um, because it was not something that we would talk about. I mean, because. Perhaps also because of my position. I mean, because I have this, I had this white mom. So it's, it, it was very interesting for me growing up in, in Somalia with this kind of, um, with a white mom. And not a, because often, I mean, the Somali Italian um, that were living in Mogadishu had a white father. This is the typical, I mean, combination in the colonial society. For me, it was the opposite. So, in a way, when I was talking about, also in the film, about uh, responsibility, for me it's very important because, uh, and individual history, as you say, because everyone has the responsibility to take a position. It doesn't mean that if you are Italian, you, 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 you have to be a colonizer. You can also take another kind of position. And uh, for me, it was very important to grow up in, this, in that kind of, uh, in, in, in that kind of situation where uh, Somalia is a very, there is a very patriarchal society. So at the end of the day, my mom, who was very young when I was born, she was um, in, this, in, the, in the social context. Oh, of course, she was not, uh, she was educated and so on, but she was in a way very vulnerable because she was young and she was white and uh, she was, especially because she was a woman. And um, so some, sometimes, I think that this, this was pivotal for me to understand really that uh, we cannot, uh, I mean, we cannot generalize, never. We always have a responsibility in life and uh, yeah, so. Thank you. I think we are good. Thank you so much to Uba Cristina Lifara, Hope Campbell Gustafsson and Simone Brioni and thank you very much to all of you.